or good evening, or good afternoon, or good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. From the Tualatin Valley Community Television Studios in beautiful green Beaver in Oregon, we bring you the Conversations with Dr. Don show. For you first-time viewers out there, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and about whatever it is that we've decided to talk about before we started rolling cameras. Now, my guest tonight is Jody Weiser. We've only got one guest on this one-hour show because after chatting with Jody earlier, we needed more than uh, an hour, so we didn't want any other guests to clutter the set. So thank you for coming on, Jody. How are you? Thanks. I'm great. Good to see you. And we talked about a number of things that are of interest to you and to me, of course. And uh, we took a generic title because there was more than one or two things that are, are of interest. And we called the topical issues as of this date, February 12, 2009. And as we get into the show, we'll uh, talk about those things. I had a list of, of uh, questions for you that we may go to and we may not, depending on how the flow goes in our conversation. And I'll take those off just for, for, for fun for, for the moment. What do you see as today's topical issues? Uh, uh, why do you see these as important enough to address tonight? Which of these will you address tonight? How do the ones you'll address get to be that important? And, and so on and so forth. So we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, you were on the show, how long ago was that? Some time ago. Well, anyhow, at least two years ago. At least I think two years been, ago. Yeah. And I'm not remembering exactly what we talked about, but I do know you were interesting and the stuff you talked about, you did it so darn well. And I've seen you in the Portland metro area at, at gatherings and seminars and forums and whatever. And uh, when you talk about uh, what you're concerned about, you do it with such passion and such knowledge until uh, I want my viewers to experience you again and uh, as you talk about things, as I said, that we're really concerned about. So let's go through a bit of the ritual here about who you are again, because it's been a couple years. And uh, no, I can't ask you when you were born because you don't do that, do you? So where were you born? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I'm, I feel good about when I was born. I was born in 1945. I was just before the baby boomers by, you know, a month or two. And, um, and I grew up on a, in a farming community, and my father was a farmer, and my mom kept the books and was the volunteer. And mm -hmm. That was the that was the place I grew up. I always thought that we were a very middle class family, but after I left and I got to know got to see the world differently, I realized that we were really very comfortable, and that the reason we were middle class was God was kept reinvesting in the farm. Uh -huh. you know? But we went on vacations, and I don't remember us ever having want or anything like that. And we employed people who did. Uh -huh. And where was this? in the desert on the Colorado River, in an area that had been a floodplain of the Colorado River. Uh, so right between California and Arizona, uh -huh. 100 miles north of Mex the Mexican border. Uh -huh. yeah. And how long did you stay there before you moved? I left there when I went to college. Yeah. And where'd you go to college? Went to UC Riverside in California. Mm -hmm. And what was your major? I majored in political science, and mm -hmm. I was really political when I was in college. Mm -hmm. Was involved in anti-war stuff and in integrated housing. We, I remember us going to apartment buildings, you know, first a black couple and then a white couple, and finding which apartment buildings were breaking the law and saying that they didn't have openings when in fact they did. And that sort of stuff when I was in college. And then I got married and had kids, and I was pretty, um, you know, I voted and I read the newspaper, but I was pretty apolitical while I was teaching and doing that um, parenting thing. So you were apolitical, and then you became political. One day I was driving to work, mm -hmm. and it was the 10th year of every spring the principal said, we have to cut $60,000 out of our budget for next year, or we have to cut $100,000 $100, out of our budget. What, what are we going to give up? 
our budget there. The you, school's you, budget. And you were, I was teaching for Portland Public Schools. I see. And I just thought, you know, we voted to not have property taxes be such a significant piece of our tax burden, but we didn't vote to destroy public education. And we're doing that. We're taking it apart piece by piece each year as it has to get less adequate. And pretty soon, people who can will insist on taking their kids to private schools, and then it'll be even harder for public schools to gain support. And so that day, I decided to quit teaching and work on trying to raise revenue. You quit teaching and became an activist? Mm -hmm. And how many years now has you been, you been doing that? It's been about eight years. Don't you get rather tired? Uh, how much success have you had? I've had enough success to not get tired. I know, I know. But, <laughs> but um, I, I've asked myself that same question because my cycle in life has been I do things for about seven years and then I have to have something new. Mm. And so it's like when will this, will I come to a point where I don't want to do this anymore? But so far, it's new learning all the time. I'm, you know, I'm becoming more experienced. I know better how to do something. Mm -hmm. But I still, there's so much about how things happen in Salem and in D.C. that I don't know that it's still, it's still in very engaging. I'm always curious about a person like you, how you came by doing what you're doing and have the dedication and the amount of work you put into it. And I've learned a little about your, where you grew up and you were born and, and your work and any other thing that would be useful for me to know about you and your upbringing to have you be the kind of an activist that you are. You're an mm -hmm. activist for populist, Im important yeah. uh, social issues. W w w how has you got to be that way? You know, I think the critical point in my life was one day, there, I li we lived in this very isolated community. It was 100 miles of desert in every direction. And my parents were the kind of parents that if we lived in a city, we would have been going to Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm and, you know, to see the La Brea tar pits and things like that. I mean, they always were go and do things. Southern California uh, things. Yeah, yeah, Southern California and, and in the 50s. Well, Blythe didn't offer many of those things to do. And so one day, we decided to go pick cotton in our own cotton fields. And that was back when people picked cotton, not machines. So as a family adventure, we went to the cotton field where my classmates were also picking cotton. And, and you had this long bag that for a child you drug through the fields. I was probably in about second grade. And you, you pick the cotton and there's these uh, Barbie kind of uh, uh, structures that hold the cotton in. So you get scratched up a little bit. You, you pick some cotton and you stick it in the bag. So after some period of time, probably not more than an hour and a half, my dad says, okay, let's see how we did. And we put all our cotton from the family's bags together and we took them up to the scale to weigh it. And my dad, who was a cigarette smoker, said, shoot, we're not make, even making cigarette money. And I understood that we decided how much people got paid. And so it explained to me why my classmates lived in houses made out of signs. Billboard. They were old billboards. Old billboards. With a uh, tire in the center that they burned trash in, the poorest kids in my school. Really? And I, it, it, it was like, well, if we're not making cigarette money, that explains why they don't have homes. And I, I understood at that moment that the inequities that happen in society. Because those people were working, but those kids were not going home now. They were going to be there all day because they were making their families living. And they were making it working for us. And we had uh, Mexican laborers that lived in a, uh, an aluminum shed behind our house, 40 of them in a building. Oh. And I never thought much about that because they were single men who of course were like migrant workers today, they would come up and go back uh, more so than now because there was a, a program that allowed them to go back and forth legally mm -hmm. then. And I didn't, that had never occurred to me as anything, I mean, it hadn't touched my heart, but when my classmates were there and I had pr just, just 
within a week or so before that, I remember um, talking with a friend about how one of those little girls didn't have any underpants on and she was going on the equipment where you could tell that and thinking that there was something wrong with her that she wasn't wearing underwear. And then I kind of learned in the field that day that maybe her parents couldn't afford underwear. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where my social conscience was born that day. And it stayed with you through the years? Yep. Okay. And do you have a, a husband, a partner now? or? Anybody? I have kids and grandkids. <laughs> okay. I have friends, uh -huh. but I've been single for quite a while now, mm -hmm. and it's it's an okay life. Mm, okay life, and you're uh, available for some uh, dashing uh, young man who would fall in love with you when he sees your lovely face on the screen. <laughs> yeah, but he'd have to, you know, understand that I actually live in Salem part of every week and things like that. <laughs> I, I think that my, uh, my work, and it feels like work even though I do it as a volunteer, mm -hmm. is really where my passion is right now. Okay. So you see yourself uh, uh, on the political continuum, left, right, or center, or what? I'm pretty far left. Pretty far left, uh-huh. What do you think of the uh, present administration on the, his chance of, of doing something different for our country? Well, I wouldn't want to be in the seat. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the problems that he has um, been handed are massive. And I think that, you know, it's possible that we'll come out of this a much stronger society because we've become pretty much individuals who own things. Mm -hmm. And that's been a a lot of the focus of things. I mean, we, uh, we, you know, our houses get bigger every 10 years. Our houses get bigger. Mm -hmm. And people, there's a lot of new houses being built near my house. And they're all 3,500 square feet. There's one that is 11,000 square feet. And there's a couple and one of their kids still living in that house. And it's like, what is with us that we would want an 11,000 square foot house? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't get us closer to the kind of human connections that are valuable to us. It keeps us away from those. And I, so I think as we make a shift here, we will realize that we can't consume the world's resources like we've been consuming them. And we'll learn to be closer to each other in the process. We'll be spending less time in front of TVs and at the, sh at the mall and more time with our neighbors. You're an educator. Uh, how, how are we going to have uh, this education and this awareness where, generally speaking, uh, these people will recognize, hey, it's so there's something more important than 11,000 square foot home. How, how are we going to accomplish that? Uh, you know, I think the circumstances will make us accomplish it. Mm. I don't. I, you know, I remember waiting in line for gas, in the when was that the '70s, yeah. and then we got smaller cars and we got more efficient houses. We had our first solar installations, because oil was not so available to us. We suddenly changed because circumstances changed us. And, and six months ago when gas was, no, more than six months ago, a year ago when gas prices were much higher, people started abandoning their huge cars and wanting little cars. Unfortunately, the gas prices went down, the economy, and so that movement isn't there. But I'm not sure we, I don't think we make change without being forced to it very easily. Mm -hmm. And it'll be the being forced to it. You know, things cost almost, they're cheap now. And so it's really easy to be wanting many things because it's cheap to buy things. But when things start costing what they really should cost, when every worker in the world is better paid and makes a, a, a living wage, then we're not going to buy so many things because it's going to be a lot more expensive. And how are we going to have everybody in the world have a better wage? that is just going to take time because they're going to demand right. it. Okay. You know, first, first I tr I've traveled a good bit. And, you know, first they get Pizza Hut, and then they get Starbucks. Well, you can get a pizza for the price of a drink at Starbucks. That starts changing people's desires and expectations. Mm -hmm. 
and unfortunately we've taken our bad food habits to the rest of the world and they're getting diabetes as well but um, but the, the, once people watch TV they want mm -hmm. they want to share too all right let me ask you one more question before we get to my questions uh, what you presented for us today because mm -hmm. I'm sure my viewers are going to be really turned on to what you'll be talking about because I've seen you talk about these things as I said earlier in other forums and presentations uh, and so on. Uh, any persons from the past are alive today uh, that you particularly admire uh, or admired or look up to? Anybody come to mind? You know, I think that's a hard qu Isn't that a hard question for women? Is, is it hard for many women? I've not found that to be true. I've found it to be hard for men or women uh, kind of well, equally as I think about it. I think Eleanor Roosevelt was about the only woman who, you know, as a, as a child I was aware of and, and felt like that was, there was, there's a woman who offered unique contributions. Uh -huh. but, but, you know, we didn't really read about any women yeah. when we were in school. Why is we that? Only, because the world was all male-centric at the time. I resemble that. I yes, mean, you do. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, that was a deliberate Freudian slip. Right. Yeah. So you see yourself as a feminist? Not particularly. Uh huh. A, a, a woman's liber. Not particularly. Well, just you know a, the difference between the two. Yeah, but I just believe in fairness. I remember thinking when I was a kid once, and my brothers were being taught the business, and I was helping my mom clean the house. It'd be better to be a guy. You know, that there was a different world being offered to them because they were guys and I was a gal. And mm. that was the kind of, that was just where I grew up, that's how I grew up. And at school, the books, the books were about the famous men. Yeah, now I need to say a few words more about that teaser I put out there. So I heard the, the, the story, the difference between a woman's liber and a feminist. A feminist says to men, you've been doing this to me all of my life. Uh, now, I won't allow that to happen in, anymore. It, it's over. And a woman's liberal says, you've been doing this to me all my life, and I'm going to do the same thing to you for the rest of your life. And that's a distinction I people have made. See, I actually think that in my generation of women, we've had the best deal. Really? Yeah because the world has changed dramatically for all of us and I think that most men of my generation grew up with a father who had a job and he kept that job and the business promoted him and the family was taken care of and there really wasn't a lot to worry about and the women didn't have our mothers were at home or they had hobby jobs and so anything we women did could easily be some kind of improvement on that. Whereas what's been happening to men is by the time they're 50, they're often thrown away by the business that they've given their heart and soul and worked 10 hours days for. And it's not been necessarily easy to save for their future. And so they have had, where women could kind of break molds, they've had the mold broken for them and have been left to forage. And so I, I, I don't feel any hostility towards guys. We, I mean, I wasn't even, when, when I could see the sexism in my father, I wasn't hostile towards him about it because that's how he grew up. That's where he was. How about the religion? Are you a religious person? Do you have a religion? Or I'm a really happy atheist. Oh, my goodness. Rick, an atheist. <laughs> Rick, i got to bug my camera right over there. So... Let's just uh, switch over now and uh, start talking about the uh, topic of issues. What do you see as today's uh, topic of issues? Well, I, I, wa I want to talk about it at the state level. Will you talk primarily. about that, that opening sign that we had and why yeah. you had that sign? Yeah, that Part sign. Interruption. That, that some of us were together um, from my group, Tax Fairness Oregon. We were together and we were making some signs the other night. Tax Fairness Oregon. And. Mm -hmm. um, and we're making signs for this thing we're planning to do, a kind of a Burma shave type thing with the legislature about corporate taxation. And one of the people had brought all the materials and she bought new stuff. 
And we said, how much did you pay for this anyway? Because, and she said, well, I paid $4 for that, $4 for that, $4 for that. And we went, wow, you went to the $4 store. We were laughing about it. And, and then we were working away. It got quiet. And she's lettering the sign. And then she said, I paid more for this sign than most corporations pay in taxes in Oregon. So that's where that opening and sign And that's, that, that's where that sign came from, was Josie saying, saying that. And we said, that's a perfect sign. That is, that's an attention-getting sign because two-thirds of corporations in Oregon pay $10 in taxes. Well, and don't they provide jobs for the citizens? It's, why yes, should they, they pay do. taxes? Well, you know what? They've, businesses have always provided jobs, but they used to pay taxes. And that's been a, it's been a shift, particularly over the last 30 years. Uh -huh. But even longer than that, I mean, farmers used to pay at full value of their land. And then it got changed so that you got a special rate as long as you kept farming your land. And they didn't pay as much in taxes. And there's been that kind of shift in pretty much every, every industry. They've, the, the taxes that businesses, especially corporations, pay have just been diminished and diminished and diminished. But the services they require have not been diminished. Why are they paying less and less taxes as the years have gone by? Why is that? Because they hire people whose job it is to fix it so they will pay less taxes. They hire people whose job it is to fix it so that who are these people? Employees or lobbyists or lobbyists. their tax division of their of the corporation. I was once at a conference for um, tax administrators, a national conference, and I was told I was the first public citizen who had ever come. There were 13 people there from Price Waterhouse. Walmart was there, the airlines were there, all sorts of business interests were there. There were no people there for the public interest except in employees that work in tax departments. And this meeting was about? It was a conference of people who are okay. tax administrators tax for, administ for states. Uh -huh. And so it's where it was their, you know, their annual meeting to get together and talk about the problems of taxing and stuff like that. Well, they were surrounded by people who didn't want to pay taxes. That's, that's who was there because those people actually paid for the, most of the cost of the conference, oh. right? Because that gave them the chance to talk to the head of the Department of Revenue of this state or that state or their staff and develop relationships and give workshops. At one point there was a workshop going on and, and I, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing and I kind of gave a little guffaw and a guy in front of me who worked for California's tax system turned and said, it is rather like the foxes are designing the hen house, isn't it? And I said, really? Yes. You know. And the same is true at, at the state legislature. There are very few people there advocating for the public good. There's lots of lobbyists there advocating for the good of corporations. And for the good of corporations, it's, we'll pay less taxes. Well, how do you, in future meetings, if you were to change things, how would you have it different so that there'd be more people representing on these kinds of uh, forums or meetings or gatherings, more people like yourself rather than lobbyists and people representing the big corporations? Well, I think, I think the fact that baby boomers are retiring are gonna help. There's more, there, I mean, I'm, there was a woman who kind of came to me this week and she was a lawyer and she drove down to Salem to work all the time and now she's gonna be a lobbyist. But she's gonna be a lobbyist for the public good. For the public good. She's working for the, she's a volunteer for the League of Women Voters. League so. of Women Voters, good. So let's take a break a minute, for a minute, and then we'll come back and continue on with the stuff that you wanted to talk about. Let's see, where are you? Uh, in a moment, we're going to put up on the screen a few panels that show information that you may want to make note of during the break. You may want to get a pencil and paper just in case. Let me tell you about the Dr. Don Show broadcast schedule. For you viewers who live in the Washington County part of the Portland, Oregon metro area, Conversations with Dr. Don shows a broadcast five times each week. Typically, a new show is first aired on a Tuesday and is rebroadcast on the following uh, Friday through Monday. You can get Conversations with Dr. Don on the Internet, too. You can tell your friends to watch Dr. Don shows on the Internet anytime by going to video.google.com and entering Conversations with Dr. Don. 
Uh, also, at any time during the show, the thought crosses your mind that you'd like to contact the people in Washington, D.C., who supposedly work for us, the citizens. You can take down the phone numbers that will also be up on the screen during the break. They want to hear from you in D.C., whether you uh, believe it or not. Uh, they're very eager to hear from us, uh, ordinary citizens, people who think that they're so important that they don't want to hear what's going on. So let's uh, put those uh, panels up on the screen and take a break for a few minutes. And we'll be back in a few. Okay, we're back. Thank you for hanging in there, and I hope you had a good glass of water, a dish of ice cream, or a cup of coffee or something, and we're ready for you, so we're going to continue on where we left off. Uh, I want to say uh, to you, you viewers who were just uh, channel surfing or something and you didn't hear the earlier part of the, sto the show, uh, the Conversations with Dr. Don that you're watching is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and whatever it is that uh, we decided to talk about that we thought you might be interested in. And Jody Weiser is my guest tonight, and uh, she's got some interesting stuff to talk to you about, about taxes and related uh, subjects. So let's continue on from where we left off. And my cheat sheet that I had, we had, what do you see as today's topical issues that you'd like to address in the remaining half hour that we have? What should we talk about? What do you tell us about? I, I really want to talk about taxes. Taxes. Be because we're, we're facing a huge meltdown 
which means that not only are private citizens losing their jobs in, in private industry, but there's way less money coming into state governments. And state governments, unlike the federal government, have to operate on the money that comes in. They can't print money. They can't indulge themselves. And so they're cutting back. And there are huge meetings going on in Salem right now to cut and cut and cut the services of government in t order to, to scale back to the amount of revenue that's coming in. So you want to talk about taxes because there's not enough tax money that's coming into Salem, for example, to so. take care of the state's needs that are paid right. for by taxes. Right. Okay. So in this state, most of the money comes in from income tax. Mm -hmm. And by a huge percentage, mostly it comes from people paying income taxes, not corporations paying income tax. So we've got a graph that shows the small piece of income tax money that comes from corporations and the large piece that comes from families. Now, some of those families have businesses and they're paying taxes through their family's taxes. If, you, if you've got a, a, a restaurant or a law practice or you're a consultant, you might have your business formed as an LLC or a partnership and your taxes actually for your business are paid right on your personal tax forms. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when I say families are paying the largest share of the taxes. There you see the big long line on the graph. Uh -huh. That's the tax revenue that's coming in as income taxes from families and some of those families have businesses. And the red part is what corporations are paying, which is a very small piece of the pie. So this is a, the, the money is available for the state to take care of its business and responsibilities. There's other money. When you play with lottery, the lottery, you pay money that becomes revenue to the state. All that's not paid out in, in, um, in fact, ever since the, we changed the law about property taxes, really the only significant new tax we have is lottery. That's our how, new source of income. How much of that? Com uh, 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 how much is that compared to the uh, the families and the corporations? It's, uh, you know, I don't know that. I mean, I could. I, I have this Just wonderful guess, guess. Da document here from the state, and it would be in here. But I think it's more than corporations, but it's significantly less. Significantly than less. less. So than families and individuals are paying the bulk of the taxes that. Uh, well, and they also are the ones that are playing the lottery. And they're okay. the ones that are drinking beer and paying beer taxes. And they're ones that are, they're, they're who's smoking cigarettes and paying cigarette taxes. And they're the ones that are buying hunting licenses and stuff like that. So most of the other revenue that comes in for the state comes from individuals, not corporations. But why should corporations pay uh, more taxes than they're paying now, since they're the ones who provide jobs for people who then can pay taxes? Well, that's a good argument that corporations have been very successful in making. Uh -huh. And we're almost now, will well, we are willing to pay part of the way for a company to come to Oregon so that they will hire people and pay wages. But that's part of a way of thinking that's been kind of perpetrated on the country over the last 30 years. People didn't used to think that way about corporations. Corporations used to think that they had a responsibility to the community that they were in and they used to pay a much larger share of taxes. So that when the individuals paid their taxes, income taxes, it didn't hurt them so bad as it does now? Well, we would ha if, if corporations were paying more, then ostensibly people could be pay paying less or the services could be better. Mm -hmm. And um, in the 30 years ago, in the 70s, I looked at a, a six-year hunk of time Corporations average during that period of time paying 16% of the income taxes in the state. And most recently, they average a little over 6%. So that's a pretty big drop. If you looked at that graph, you would see the red would have been much bigger 30 years ago. Now, I noticed you used the term perpetrated before, and you're describing what the, uh, the corporations are paying in taxes. Well, corporations are, are persons, are, and they have, they, have, they have the same... Uh, duties and responsibilities and treatment as, as human beings. What do you think about corporate personhood? Corporations then if, look at as persons. So if corporations want personhood, which they seem to want when it's to their benefit, mm -hmm. then why shouldn't they be paying 
for the benefits of personhood. I mean, corporations use our court system more than people do. Yes. I mean, even if you think of bankruptcy, well, bankruptcy is all about protecting the people who loan the money to the families that are going bankrupt. It, you know, that's, that's what it's about. Uh, they use our court system more than we do. They use our roads. I mean, who's to say when a truck is going down the road, is it for the people who are going to buy that product or is it for the corporation that is getting the product to market? It's hard to say who needs that road, but that we all do. And we all need to be participating in paying. But corporations pay 6.6% in the state. But that does, don't the corporations then have more money available for investment and, and building the business and, and, and succeeding and growing so and, that they can hire more people? And if, they, and if they paid more taxes and we had smaller class sizes, we would have more employees. It's not like if you take some money from the corporation and you give it to the government, it goes away. It's used to hire employees in the government instead. So and they, those jobs, those jobs uh, generate revenue as well. As, as a matter of fact, there was recently a study that showed that if you spend a dollar of tax money, in many of the ways we spend tax money, it actually is worth $2.66 because we get federal money to match it. And we don't collect all the federal money available to Oregon. What? We left about $700 million untouched in the last biennium because we didn't have enough money to match it. So we couldn't get it. There's a lot of federal money comes that they'll give you this much, but you have to put in this much. And we didn't have that money to put in. Well, if we'd had the corporate money there, uh -huh. we would have been able to match it. And so we would have gotten more of that federal money. And we would have had more opportunities to take care of kids that don't have health care or seniors that need to have in-home services and that sort of thing. So as a result of production or manufacturing or something, say there's a dollar available from this effort and then a certain percentage of it goes to the worker and a certain percentage of it goes to the corporation. Well then the, the worker who makes this money uh, hasn't made enough to really have any substantial savings. Uh, they're buying and acquiring more stuff and that percentage that goes to the corporation, where does that money go? Does that go to shareholders or investors and, and, and uh, CEOs and managers and the whole mm -hmm. group? And some people say, you know, corporations don't pay taxes, only people pay, pay only real people pay taxes. And that's, that's actually true. Corporations corporations end up, you know, they've got their books and if they have extra money, they distribute it to their shareholders. So if there's, if they've paid more taxes, they will distribute less to their shareholders or they'll have smaller bonuses for their execs or they'll, they'll pay smaller wages or they'll charge more to whoever they're selling their product to and then they'll have the amount they want. So it, you don't, when you charge a corporation taxes, you don't really know where it's going to get paid. It's going to get paid however they can do it. If they've got a product that people are happy to buy at whatever price, they're just going to add it into the price of the product. But most business doesn't live in that universe. Most businesses live in some kind of competitive market. Competitive yeah. market. So the existing system and the amount of taxes that corporations pay compared to ordinary citizens, the, uh, that's not fair. You don't like that. Well, it's perpetrated on us. Two-thirds of corporations in Oregon pay $10 to the state. So? Two-thirds of people pay taxes. Some people are too poor to pay taxes, and some corporations don't make much money. Right? Mm -hmm. But way more people pay taxes than corporations pay taxes. So why would that be and how could that be right? I mean, no, no corporation is set up to be so unprofitable that it makes no money year after year and yet they're paying taxes, some of them, no taxes year after year. Well, they're existing because they are making money. They just have found a way to not pay taxes on the money they make. Okay. You now are going to be in a position 
to decide what we're going to do with the system to change things and have it be more equitable mm -hmm. and better for the ordinary citizens. So you're, what making would you me, do? You're, you're making me all powerful or do I have to actually convince the legislature or something? What would you do? In, what I would do um, right now, as a citizen, as the, what I what I do as a citizen yes. is I what I do as a citizen is um, I've been working with other people like myself uh -huh. in my group and in other organizations, and we've kind of come up with a plan for increasing corporate taxation. Okay, I'm all ears. So our governor <laughs> has said, oh, this fact that the corporations are only paying ten dollars is a problem, and he's come up with a plan, and it would raise about forty thousand. Forty million dollars a year. Our governor's name is Kulingowski. Kulingowski, Oregon governor. And that's governor. the plan. That's the bill that he's put forward. And we're saying we just need to add one zero. We don't want forty million. We want four hundred million a year from cap. What's he think of that basically idea? Basically, we want to double what they're what they're paying. At this point, he doesn't. He's not the decider. At this point, the legislators are the deciders mm -hmm. because they will they will develop the law and move it forward and it'll come to him for signature and then he would he, he could reject it or accept it but I think if something came out of the legislature that would tax corporations much more heavily than an extra 40 million a year he wouldn't go against it because we're gonna have people who are in dire straits and we we're gonna want whatever money we can get and so I think that it's going to, this is actually a good year for maybe being able to move. We, the momentum will be there to say we need to get more from corporations. People will be in dire straits because there won't be the monies available for health care and for the citizens who need. There won't be money available for food. For food. food bank is going to be food. out of food. Unless there's, there's more monies available. And we've, and we are one of the, we're, commonly placed as one of the ten cheapest places to do business, but we have one of the highest unemployment rates. So our low taxes don't seem to be working in our favor. Mm -hmm. If we were, if it was really successful, having really low taxes was successful, then why would, then we would have a 6% unemployment rate while everybody else had an 8%, but instead we have a 10% unemployment rate while everybody else has an 8%. With your plan so, that, that, the, that the governor is, is pushing now, do you have any idea how much uh, the, corporation, the corporations will pay uh, compared to what they've been paying so far? Well, what we would like to do, there are kind of three parts to what we've come up with. Okay. The first part is, why do corporations get to pay 6.6%? Most people, a family that makes... Um, that has $15,000 worth of taxable income, so probably they have $20,000 worth of earnings. Mm -hmm. Any dollar over that that they, that they pay taxes on to the state, they're gonna pay 9% nine, 9 in taxes. Mm -hmm. A corporation can be, have a, a million dollars worth of profit, they're gonna pay 6.6%. .6%. So our first idea is take the corporations that now pay taxes, those that are paying more than $10, and put them on the same rate scale that people have. Oh. So instead of paying 6.6%. Because they're persons, aren't they, the corporations? They want the benefits of being it. They need to, have the, they need to have pay the cost of being it. Sure. But we could do that, and that would bring in a good hunk of money, but we would still have two-thirds of our corporations paying $10 because they've found ways to diminish their taxable income. So we need a new way to tax them on a different system that captures some revenue from them. And um, we don't know which corporations they are because in this sta state we don't have that, we aren't allowed that information. We can know things like wholesalers in this state pay the largest hunk of taxes but we can't know whether one wholesaler or another one pays taxes. And th there's a state that does know some information. And for instance, they know that they've got Pepsi and Coca-Cola being sold in their state. One of them pays a million dollars in taxes. The other one pays uh, zero. Well, we don't know that. We don't even know who are the bad players in our state. 
And How'd that come about? That we don't know. There's a state law, a statute th or something? There's all sorts of privacy rules about that kind of knowledge. And so one of our proposals is if you want the, the cheap plan, if you want to pay only $80, $40 million a year, we talk in bienniums in the legislature, so I, I, I'm trying to talk in years because that's how your audience <laughs> and I at yeah. home all Thank think. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, if they want the, if they want to go with the forty the forty million dollar a year plan, well, fine. But then we want corporate disclosure. We want to know who paid ten dollars, who paid a hundred thousand dollars, who paid a million dollars, who paid ten million dollars. We want because we should be able to tell that. How can we? It's really hard to write good tax law when you don't know who's paying the taxes. We know that right now we're giving big tax credits to wind farms. If you build a wind farm, we'll give you $11 million. But they're selling the tax credits. And that's probably because they don't expect to pay any taxes. Selling tax credits. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. And so, so it's so we have to, so we're looking for how to, to get first the people who are currently paying taxes to pay more. The second thing is to come up with a plan to try to tax those other businesses that really are continuing to exist in Oregon year after year because they're profitable but they're not paying taxes. And what the idea is to come up with a different tax base. And there are basically two ways that most states do it. One is how much did you sell? Oh, you sold a million dollars worth of goods, well then you're going to give us a small piece of that million dollars. And neighboring stores sold five million dollars worth of goods, they're going to give us five times as much. And that's called gross receipts tax. Mm -hmm. The other way you do it is you say, well, what did you add to this product when it was at your business? If you were a lawyer, you mostly added people's ability to think. If you're a grocery store, you mostly you didn't you didn't create the food. You might have cut up some meat, but mostly you put product on the shelf and checked people at, out at the cash register. Mm -hmm. And so in each of those cases, you would figure out, well, what did this business add? And we'll tax you on what you added to the product at your business. And that seems fair because if you're a, a big firm and you do everything within your firm, you're not going to be selling. You wouldn't be, you wouldn't be selling and buying to create your product. Mm -hmm. What's an example? Okay, say you have a farm and you grow green beans. Well, if you also have a processing plant, then there's no tax for you between, if you have gross receipts, between growing your crop and, and, and Putting canning out the it. Cans. But if you are a small farmer and you just grow your beans, then you're going to sell and with the gross receipts, you'd pay a tax, and then when the canner sold it, he'd pay a tax. And so the, your product would obviously already be more expensive than the big company's product that didn't have to have that intermediate tax. So that's why we like kind of, well, let's just tax what you added to the product. And that it's called a value added tax usually. All right, I'm gonna challenge you. Mm -hmm. How likely is it that the approach you're suggesting in Salem, that the governor's gonna go along with it and it's going to pass? By adding a zero to this forty thousand dollars or forty million dollars, what's the likelihood of that passing? I don't. I don't know. We had a win already this session, mm -hmm. and whether we'll have another win or not, I don't know. It what was helps that win? The um, when the federal government just passed the stimulus, they're just passing the stimulus package mm -hmm. right now. One of the things they put in there is something that would make it so a big business could do what's called bonus depreciation. That means if you've built, like Intel said, they're going to put $7 billion of investment in, right? Well, they would get to deduct half of it in the very first year of their taxes if they had that much tax liability. Currently, they have to spread it out over many years. That's a big advantage to them. It's a big hit to the tax system in the state. And we felt like it was more important for the legislators to decide what are we going to do with our tax system rather than let the federal government decide what's going to happen with Oregon's tax system. And we wanted 
to stop that major cost that we could see might happen there, and which we don't believe actually stimulates much behavior. Intel decided long ago that they had to re-mechanize themselves to build a better product in order to be competitive. Mm -hmm. That's what they needed to do, whether they got bonus depreciation or not. They made the decision to do it, and now we're just giving them a gift. Okay. That gift might be better spent getting some other business the help it needs in order to get started, or taking care of kids, or f getting food to the food bank. Back to my question a moment ago. Mm -hmm. By adding a zero to that number, and I, I think I asked you what was the likelihood of the governor embracing that and the legislature embracing it so that it passes, and you said you didn't know. Mm -hmm. It's just that that you discussion no is just beginning. I think that it's far better than it was two years ago mm -hmm. because we've elected a lot of Democrats. Sometimes people so, work on, on issues like what you're talking about now, and they don't expect it to really pass this time, but they're working in a, in a direction. But raising, we've been working ra on this wait, wait, for a wait, while. Wait, wait a minute. Raising consciousness so that in succeeding years, It'll pass. So you mm -hmm. think there's a chance that it'll pass in, in, in this there's session? A, I, I think we will get some wins. I'm not sure what wins okay. we will get. But I think we'll get some wins because when we walked into the studio tonight, people in the studio knew that most corporations only pay $10. Well, that's been hard work to get okay. that message out. But we've gotten that message out. People know, and it doesn't, it, it, you can feel it. That's not right. It's Good. not, it's, it, and so I think the fact that it's not right and the fact that we're going to be in dire straits helps us. Now, we could be talking about taxing wealthy people more, and I think that's another shift that will probably happen. You think so? Mm hmm I think there'll be a change. Okay. I'm not sure which one of the ideas that's out there will move, but I think there'll be a change in the, sta right. in the state of Oregon. And I think there, I know there's changes in other states. I was just today looking at a website for uh, New York, and they're going to raise taxes quite a lot, like 3% for their wealthiest citizens. They're going to raise it one step if the family makes, I hate to say this because I don't have this down, but mm -hmm. there's a step at 250, 250,000, there's another step at 500,000, and there's another step at a million dollars. And those, and if you've got a million dollars worth of taxable income, you're going to be paying about 3% more. And that, I think it's very likely to pass in New York. And there are other states where that movement is happening. It happens, it's happened historically. It's nothing, it's really not new. I mean, the I'm, Great Depression, we did this. I'm getting a high sign mm -hmm. from director saying, stop. <laughs> we're about out of time. Thanks, Dennis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me do some uh, little uh, speaking here, and then we'll right. have a couple more words, okay? Mm -hmm. And keep those pens and pencils handy, because you may want to jot down something that we'll, we'll show you in the closing credits, and thank you for watching. I invite you to give us feedback, both positive and negative, about any aspect of the show, and I really mean it. It helps us to give you a better show. And my email address is friendlydon at AOL.com. The guest email address was up on the screen during the show. When you write Dr. Don, uh, let us know if it's okay or not okay to read your email on the air. I got a couple of public service announcements I like to make. I want to tell you about the Alliance for Democracy, my favorite activist organization. There's a national website. Go to the website and see what we're about. It's really terrific. And we have a local chapter of the Alliance for Democracy in the Portland chapter. There's a phone number and website. David Delk is our co-chair. Great organization. The ACLU. I can't forget the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. Without the ACLU, I'm afraid the, uh, the Bill of Rights would be down the tubes with this past eight years of the Bush administration. And the ACLU hotline. Let's put that uh, uh, panel up on the screen. The ACLU wants to know if you've been stopped by uh, over-eager law enforcement because of some phony reason because of how you look. Uh, maybe a racial profiling. They want to know about it. Call that number and report it. And i uh, tell you about the American Humanist Association, the AHA. I've been a member for years. I'm a, a humanist and a humanist minister. 
Uh, there's a great organization there. And Democracy Now! Uh, that's on cable TV and satellite TV and on the, the internet. DemocracyNow.org. Amy Goodman uh, is one of my heroes. Look that up. Before we say goodnight, I want to say thank you to my wonderful crew and my floor director and everybody else involved here. It's been a good time tonight, and thank you for coming. And I thank you to other parts of the country where you're watching the show. Thank you for watching, and you have a final thought in about 10 seconds. <laughs> Join us in getting this changed. There need to be more people in Salem that are just there for the common good. And people around the country keep working for the common good. That's an important note to finish on. And thanks again for watching. And remember, as I always say, and I really mean it, KFC and not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC. Kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable to you too. And you too, and you too, and you too, and you too, and you too. <laughs> thanks again. Good night. <laughs>